Good morning. Hey, Danny. Please don't start with a long lecture on regulation and trust. Just welcome. Oh, oh sorry. It's not for you. It's, it's for me. Let me start again. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome you all for the coming for coming to Jerusalem from all around the world, deputy ministers of education, director generals, senior, senior staff, teachers, lecturers, school principals, and academic, academic researchers. To, the, to participate in the third international Van Leer Education Conference focusing on the fascinating theme from regulation to trust, education in the 21st century. My name is Danin Barr, and I am the, the academic chair of the Department of Education in Van Leer and the academic chair of the conference. Hence, you know by now, if something will go wrong during the conference, whose, whose fault is it? <laughs> and everything which will go well is a success of our fascinating team. And I mean it, it's not a matter of good regulation, it is a matter of trust. Let me open the conference by inviting Dr. Dan Gipton with a lecture on who owns Israeli education, the messy governance of schools. Dan Gipton is one of our most prominent researchers from Tel Aviv University. It's not to blame it, it's only Tel Aviv the School of Education and the Faculty of Law. Dan combines his two disciplines to understand and to explain the success and failure of the educational management in general and educational reform in particular. Dan, please. Right. Good morning, everyone. Boker tov lekulam, shalom. In my uh, prefatory notes, I'm quoting a, a great song by Ehud Banai, an Israeli songwriter, who says, um, as you can see, when the Lord said, let there be light, it was in the language of the Hebrew man. And when Moses said, let my people go, it was in the language of the Hebrew man. So I speak the language of the Hebrew man. Um, but today it's going to be in English. So let's have a look at what we're going to talk about. Um, who owns Israel's education, the messy governance of Israel's schools? And I hope you can all see well. I'm going to walk around a bit. Um, I work in Tel Aviv University. I'm also a research fellow at the Institute of Education at the University of London. Um, thank you very much for this invitation, and especially for Dan Inbar, who's become a kind of an informal mentor of mine for a few years now, although I've never been his student. But I've learned a lot from him, and I learn all the time. So thank you. This is what I do. Uh, I teach education policy and law in Tel Aviv University. Um, I've been a member of several, several committees that have to do with education policy and law in Israel. And, um, of course, my forthcoming book, which is Law, Education, Politics, and Fairness, England's Fantastic Legislation for Education Reform. But I'm not going to talk about um, England today. And this is just for you to choose as a Christmas present for your friends. It'll be on Amazon soon. And um, this is the kind of stuff I do. Um, well, am I, I guess I'm also a kind of a fashion icon, which you can already see. Um, okay, some prefatory notes, except for Ehud Banai. Tony Bright from the Carnegie Foundation, one that I like very much, which said, everything works somewhere, nothing works everywhere. A really good one. Um, there are only two kinds of madness one should guard against. One is the belief that we can do everything. The other is the belief that we can do nothing. There are no solutions, just shifting around of problems. David Mamet, the American playwright. Um, if I fall off the stage, just call 911, I guess. 
Um, in Israel, the present is stationary, only the past changes constantly, which is a really cool one, isn't it? Yoram Kanyuk, the Israeli author. Um, and th that's actually the opening for the stuff I want to talk about. Uh, the conceptual framework for this, for this study, which has also been partly published um, uh, in the Education Management Administration and Leadership uh, Journal, the one that is edited by Tony Bush in England, uh, is kind of eclectic. I'm going to talk a little bit about governance, um, something about law-based uh, reform and social-legal studies, of course, about regulation theory, August, which is very important from the University of Manchester, the, I, the best book I know about that. Public education and issues of equity and equality and education, neoliberalism, corporatism, commodification, and managerialism. All these people. I'm going to whisk quickly through some, some theory. Okay, I hope everyone can see. Are we doing okay? Um, in, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'm like on, I'm living on the edge, right? Okay, we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, John Kingdon has taught us about the necessary prerequisites for uh, policy change, which are politics, uh, problems, politics, and policies that have to come together to create a policy window. And I'm going to talk about that regarding Israel's education. I'm going through the the, some very basic the theory very quickly. First is the concept of an educational regime. I don't know if you know of this researcher, Ronald Manzer from Canada. Um, he's done some very important work about education policy and has brought forward this term of education regime, which is a collective response to a primary problem of political economy. Acceptance of a core of political ideas is may derive from a dominant pol political ideology, but more often will be created from conflict and compromise among the proponents of opposing doctrinal positions. And it implies a distinctive set of public policies covering both the governance and the provision of education. Now, Manzer says that neoliberal governments in neoliberal countries, which Israel is becoming part of that group, if it's good or bad, we'll see, is actually harnessing education to a neoliberal ideology. And this is where he comes up with this term of an educational regime. Um, and then we have Paul Hill, of course, the important American researcher who writes about governance, who talks about optimists about governments think rules can control just enough to allow professional judgment to be used effectively. Standards-based reform, today's mainstream approach to improvement of public education, takes this just enough guidance approach. Pessimists about governments doubt that rules can be so perfectly aligned. What is not controlled what is literally left to chance is whether teachers, principals, and parents retain the capacity, resources, and freedom required to provide the support of good instruction. Pessimists view governance as a, inevitably a squeaky wheel system, which is really a part that I really I like. It's really good. And then August, the legal theorist from the University of Manchester in England, who writes about regulation and legal theory, um, talks about this linear idea that we can control public policy, um, e.g. education, uh, through some strict form of linear regulation. That is, have a theory, have an idea how, on how things can work, decentralize everything, privatize everything, and then control it. So he talks about having a central pool of information on which rulers must rely for regulatory measures could never replicate the widely dispersed fragments of knowledge which individuals use in pursuance of their own ends and therefore could never be adequate to anticipate all the variety of circumstances to which specific regulation must be applied. So from this point of view, I'm going to start talking um, right away on the topic of this talk, which is who owns Israel's education. Now, I'm going to begin with a short overview about what's going on here. The pros and cons, maybe, and uh, strong points and weak points on Israel's education system to get you kind of acquainted. And the strong points of our system is maximum accessibility to higher education, ranked first or second in the world in accessibility to higher education between the ages of 25 and 65, according to the OECD 2011 data while maintaining a high academic level. Three major institutions, Tel Aviv and another one east of Tel Aviv, uh, 
that has been mentioned before. Um, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the Technion, not in that order. The Hebrew University is first for now. Uh, among the top uh, 100 of the TES list, uh, despite teaching in Hebrew, the language of the Hebrew man, to PhD level, a high retention rate ranked first or second in the world in K-12 education or K-13 education, and relatively high integration. Weak points are severe inequality in distribution of resources between Jews and Arabs, between center and periphery, between natives and immigrants, and substantial gaps in school and classroom size. A lacunae in definition and clear distinction between public, private, and quasi-private education, which has a lot to do with regulation, I'm going to talk about that later, flattened governance with chains, federations, and NGOs acquiring power, untamed processes of privatization and uncontrolled schools within schools, a decrease in international K-13 attainment, and a decrease in teacher quality and poor employment conditions. Um, specifically, Israel's legal system has, does pose several problems of regulation, and I guess of trust, regarding our system. Uh, the problems are we have a dated education legislation, not updated, mainly from the 1950s, not updated and disconnected from reality. The main legal regulatory problem in Israel's system is that we have legislation. If you look at legislation, it presents a certain picture of a system, highly centralized, government or LEA owned, while the practical reality of Israel's education is a fastly becoming decentralized, semi-privatized, marketized system with schools belonging to chains, federations, networks, um, quite similar perhaps to things that are happening in England. Now one of the guests here is Sir William Atkinson, who is the head teacher of a large comprehensive high school in White City in London. And in his school, he is actually struggling and battling with these ideas of semi-privatization of comprehensive public education to chains and federations. A very similar thing, similar thing is happening in Israel, but contrary to what is happening in England, it is not backed by legislation or any, uh, I would say, balancing power. So this is one point. Then we have broad reforms executed by cabinet without primary legislation. There is no strict legal definition for school status and type and their meanings. And there's no primary legislation that deals with the question of equality and choice. There is no primary legislation that deals with the contents of free education in the responsibility of the state, nor with the students, uh, with the students, um, oops, sorry about that. How that happened? I don't know. Yeah, technology. One moment, sorry. Okay, we're live. <laughs> this is coming from worse to bad. Oh, great, updates. <laughs> we're going to have updates. <laughs> great. This is so, so cool. I'm actually shivering, but you know, well... It's never too cold to be cool. <laughs> this is like a really vintage computer. It'll be auctioned among you once we're over. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Fire away. Uh, when I was here for the first time three years ago, uh, Israel was still preparing or discussing the Constitution. So, could you tell us what's the situation of the preparation of the Constitution? That's Yoram Kenyuk. Okay. The present is stationary, don't worry. We're still discussing the Constitution. It's been going on for 65 years. So... so you don't have to come here like every three years. You can come like every ten years. It's, it's cool. I mean, it's, 
Well, first of all, we have what is called um, legally a materials con constitution, just like in England. It's not a written constitution. And there is a lot of debate in... Oh, still updates? Oh, cool. Um, so we have, in this material constitution, there's a very strong debate on issues of social rights. And there is a cry for uh, basic legislation on the right to education. So far, this has not been done. We have a student's right law from t year 2000, which generally talks about the right to education, but it's not part of any constitution yet. And the Supreme Court has not yet um, defined education as a basic constitutional right, but perhaps what is called in the United States and in Canada as a constitutional interest, which is a weaker um, constitutional tool than a constitutional right, an interest rather than the right. Okay? Yeah, for any other questions so far? How are we doing? Okay. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. שים F5 ואני כבר אסתדר. תודה רבה. Yeah. I really apologize about that. You know, going to a neoliberal society, don't you think that lecturers should have like commercials in their PowerPoints? Wouldn't that be cool? Okay. Let's hope this doesn't happen again. But it probably won't. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Um, no primary legislation that deals with the hierarchy of authorities inside the ministry. Um, the permanent secretary, the CEO of Israel's minister, Ministry of Education, um, Ms. Dalit Stauber, is sitting here in the front row. And she knows how difficult it is to run this system with all this decentralization, without definite hierarchy of authority in legislation um, that has to do with LEAs, the Ministry of Education versus school principals, local councils, and so on. Okay, but when I was talking about the basic um, data of Israel's system and the strong points, one of the most impressive is the one about higher education. This is 2011 OECD data and you can see that Israel is ranked first, second in the world, together with Canada, in accessibility to higher education, and quite dramatically higher these two countries are than all the others. So this is a very important thing, but I can also tell you that this data does not break the chain or the link between socioeconomic status and higher education, although we have such a high percentage of people accessing higher education. So this is a good thing, but still a problem. Now let's have a look a little bit on Israel's system, both legally and pedagogically. Um, this is a part that is always fun to teach when I teach in England. And it's going to happen here as well. I explain the slide or something similar to that. And then people seem to understand, but then they come up to me and say, how does this really work? So Israel has like three major types of schools, but actually more like 25. The three major ones are the national formal schools that include both modern Orthodox Jewish and Arab Palestinian schools, the national formal um, stream or group of schools that is there through um, legislation from the 1950s, these belong to the state or to the LEA, LEA being local educational authority. Um, their curricular is a compulsory statutory national curriculum. They're funded 100% by the government, and their number of students are about 850,000. This data is 2 to 2010. It's not a big difference. Their staff is licensed. 
The second most interesting group of schools are called recognized non-formal, according to the National Education Act 1953, Section 11. These are a kind of a residual idea. In 1953, when this was enacted, the government said, well, not everyone can be national and formal. So we must have some leeway for a small group of schools that will be something else. In 2012, this group has about 20 or 25 different groups of schools that are funded between 65 to 100% by the government and hold 350,000 students. This is the most interesting group because it has chains, networks, federations, private schools, NGOs, quangos, quangos being quasi-NGOs, um, uh, quasi um, and a lot of um, ultra-Orthodox, known also as Haredi, uh, schools. The third group, not being very big, are called exempt schools. They are exempt from compulsory education according to the Compulsory Learning Act 1949 Section 4 and the School Supervision Act 1969 Section 2. These are ultra-Orthodox NGO-run schools. Um, their curricula is sometimes general to the age 13, then Talmudic, that is Jewish Orthodox, they are funded 55 to 65 percent by the government and hold a bit less than 50,000 students. The licenses of their teachers are kind of unclear. So this is the most interesting group that has to do with decentralization processes in Israel's school system. Now, turning this into a more graphic image, you can see the endless list of schools and types of schools that we have in Israel. I mean, the formal recognized, okay, being this column, okay, we have this column, and then I'm going to talk about this column, but this column, the national formal recognized are these, they're here in the middle, okay? And all the other types of schools, and there are many more, but we didn't have enough room, in, like in the slide, to put all of them, are all um, factions and group of schools that were once part of the national religious or the national secular schools that, as I said, hold both Jewish and Arab schools in the national secular. And by the way, this is one of the most important points, I would say, of perhaps um, segregation or inequality in Israel's system. While Jewish students can choose between secular schools, religious schools, and ultra-Orthodox schools, the Arab sector, which are about 18-19% of the population, quite a large number, um, can only go to an Arab school. I mean, if you have an Arab religious, Arab-Palestinian religious citizen, they are, not they are not given by law a chain of religious schools everywhere in Israel, in every city. Yes, absolutely. That is the fact. There is nothing like the Mamlakhti Dati for an Arab citizen in every town and in every place in Israel. That's the point, all over. So, yes, but there is no separate religious, there is no separate religious education for Arab students in Israel as there is for separate religious Jewish students in Israel, separate religious. That's the point. Um, and that's a problem. On the other hand, the Palestinian Arab Israeli population, being what you would perhaps call a first nation or an indigenous nation in the world, has schools in Arabic in their language, which is quite rare for other countries that have indigenous slash first nation schools like Canada, like Australia and others. So this is quite interesting. So here we have many, many types of schools. Some of them are religious, some of them are secular, and, they are, and, and these schools all around here are the recognized non-formal schools that we've seen in this column in the previous slide. Okay, so we're talking about a highly multicultural, pluralistic system
that is slowly falling out of the grasp of LEAs and the government. I'm not saying if this is a good or bad thing, uh, but I, I would say, well, I, I would make two points on this. I think that from a multicultural point of view, from a pluralistic point of view, Israel's system is one of the most pluralistic in the world. On the other hand, this process of decentralization and multiculturalism is quickly gnawing at the basic equality of the system and of integration. Because, of course, you understand when you have so many systems of schools that belong to different populations, the system is much less integrated than it was 20 years ago. It's much more pluralistic. It's much more multicultural. It offers different groups of parents and students many types of education in many parts of the country. But on the other hand, there is less integration, less equality, and less tools for equity. Equity being the tool that can move the system into equality. Okay, equity and equality. That is important. So if we look at the system today, um, a school in Israel, and this is from my 2011 study, um, a school in Israel today has to tackle many different powers and actually build its educational, perhaps financial capacity from many different sources. Um, the head teacher or school principal has to look perhaps, of course, at the government, the ministry, which is still its main provider, the LEA, a network or a quango, a trust that is run by parents, some kind of faith organization like a, a parochial authority. Um, of course, there is a national curriculum, national funding, and a national enrollment policy, although these are ignored more and more by schools as we go through time, a lot more than it was before. Not so much the national curriculum, which is being recognized also by that, by that main column of, of recognized schools, and funding is always accepted happily by the schools. But enrollment policy is becoming more and more a local issue and more and more a school issue. This is very much like in England, where today you have over 6,000 schools that are their own admissions authority in England. I hope I'm okay with that number. I think it's, it's, it's all right. And uh, this is happening in Israel as well as the ministry and the LEA are losing more and more control of the different recognized schools. Unfortunately, the courts have lately um, been very friendly to schools, to chains and federations of schools, private schools, semi-private schools, that are asking to be recognized, funded by the government, but not controlled by the government. So what this means is that we have many schools that are funded by the public, These are funded mainly by the public, a lot of them up to 100%, but are not controlled by the public. So the Ministry of Education, the CO, and the, the permanent secretary that are here with us today are struggling a bit because they fund schools but do not control them to the degree that they fund them. And therefore, although the public has a large stake in this group of schools, the control of these schools is moving to other powers. Now, this is something unique because a lot of the processes that I've described here are happening elsewhere in Canada, in the United States, in New Zealand, in Australia, in the United Kingdom. But this idea of a school that is not controlled by the public but is funded by the public is quite original and is not making me too happy. If we look a bit at school finance during these years, we can see that today the budget of a single school is built like a pyramid. At the base, we can still find a large chunk of money 
that goes through the Ministry of Education, funding by formula, by age, type of school, type of education, type of supervision, etc. Then we have Ministry of Education funding that goes through centralized projects. Then we have LEA money that comes from council tax. Now, inequality begins here, and maybe here, because sometimes when a school joins a project, it needs matching money. The matching money comes from the LEA, so often schools that join projects, like an ICT project or a self-managing school or something like that, actually some of those projects go to stronger schools or stronger LEAs because they can match the money. But inequality certainly begins from this point because LEA money through council tax that is transferred to schools, by the way, illegally because they're not supposed to use council tax for schools, but they do, of course, creates severe inequality because of the gaps of earning and council tax between municipalities. This was one of the strong points of Israel's education until, say, the 1990s. I mean, we know that in America, for instance, there are large gaps in schooling, in school funding, because most of the money comes from some kind of council tax, which, of course, is connected to the value of property. In Israel, this was different. But since the 1990s, a lot of LEA money is going into schools and creating substantive gaps. Now, the Ministry of Education is trying to fight that. And the government is trying to fight that by giving more money uh, to poor LEAs. But the gap is still substantial. And then, of course, we have money that is raised by schools from commercial and financial bodies and schools that themselves belong to financial or business type bodies or NGOs. And of course, these schools would have a lot more money. And finally, parents' money that goes into schools via trusts. Again, something that the government is fighting. There are regulations and circulars against that. But schools are circumventing this through all kinds of legal tools and also with quiet support of the LEAs that are very happy that parents' money is going into schools quite often. So this is all about that point of inequality in Israel. Since only lately have Arab-Palestinian and Arab-Bedouin schools began to go through similar decentralization and privatization efforts. And there are several very interesting court cases from the very last year, um, one from the El Qasami schools in Bakajat, one from Mashhad just from a couple of weeks, weeks ago, um, where the ministry is trying through the courts to prevent these um, attempts of decentralization. This only works partly. Um, very quickly, some data about Israel's school system. How are we doing? Uh, where's the boss? How are we doing with time? Nurit done. Anyone? Okay, no one's here. We're, we're all we're all along. So we're yeah. Okay. Um, we'll we'll just move on to some karaoke or something. Pardon? Yeah, I know. I know what the time is. But okay, we're yeah. <laughs> that's that's all right. Yeah. Um, okay. A little bit about. Um, money spent on schools, as you can see, so-called, I mean, a lot of government, um, government people are going to tell you that Israel is spending a large chunk of its annual expense on education. That is true, but because we have quite a few children, we are situated um, below the OECD average, as you can see, um, in uh, school expenditure to 2010. Okay, you can see Israel here. This is OECD average. These are the higher ones, as you can see here. Um, you see the national expense for R&D is very high in Israel. Comparatively, we're first in the world in that, and first in the world in the number of academic patents. Um, and first in the world regardless of the size of the population. It's quite interesting. Um, OK, Teams Math Exams 2010. As I told you, we have some problems about um, K-12 attainment. 
Um, distribution of students. I'm just whisking through that quickly and then I'll go back to some of the more important issues. Distribution of students' achievement at the age of 15, as you can see, um, quite interesting between university, college, and others. Um, we can go back to that later. This one is really interesting. Okay, Hebrew speakers, Arabic speakers, and uh, the gaps in achievement between them. Um, you can see that among the uh, weaker groups, we have a large gap between Hebrew speakers and Arab speakers, quite large, substantially, between the low achievement and the high achievement. And this, of course, is a problem that is also political, ethnic. Um, look at this one. Social and economic background and achievement. Socioeconomic, not ethnic this time. You can see um, that sciences, reading, and math, um, there is a strong link between socioeconomic status and achievement in schools. This one being the high SES, this one being the low SES in the three areas of study. Okay? Um, one of the most problem is the admissions requirements for higher education institutions in teacher education. Now, this one is university, this is college, and this is teacher's college. Okay? So the requirements for entering into teaching is the lowest among our academic institutions and is certainly a problem. And with that goes this data that shows that the average age of teachers, especially in uh, secondary schools, has gone up from 29 to above 50 between 1991 and 2007. So we're talking about an aging workforce with the new recruits coming in through institutions that are not highly rated academically. That was the previous one, okay? So we have this one and this one put together. Okay, uh, I'll try to sum up. Um, if I'm talking about the possibilities of reform, this model, and of course, uh, you will get the PowerPoint later. I'm sure they'll distribute it to you. You can, you can use that and keep it. Um, th this uh, model is talking about uh, the socio-political dimensions and the pedagogical dimensions of change in Israel, which is um, differentiated into high probability political and legal and low probability. And then we have high and low in the pedagogical dimensions and high and low on the socio-political dimensions. So this is the most interesting part because these are the types of reform that I think could be achieved in Israel both socio-politically and pedagogically. And this includes expanding school age to K-15 and extending school day, and perhaps improving teacher education and supporting alternative evaluation policies. These are things that can be achieved. The low probability is probably cooperation between LEAs or any other form of lessening the influence of municipal boundaries. Israel has 260 LEAs. The United Kingdom has 155. There are 60 million people living there, 7 or so million living in Israel, 260 LEAs. This is a major obstacle for school reform, equality, and efficiency. There is a lot of waste going on, a lot of problems changed because of this large number of LEAs. The United States is not in such a good place either. There are 14,000 school districts in America today which is more than in Israel. It's as if we had 300. But they're improving because in the 1920s, they had 130,000 school districts. So, you know. Um, if you look at the stuff that David Cohen from Michigan has done on this, I mean, he's like collected a lot of this data. Um, then we have things that are low probability on the pedagogical dimensions, but high probability on the socio-political ones. For instance, um, having some kind of alternative standards like the International Baccalaureate or the European Baccalaureate. This is very much promoted by parents and other groups, but the teachers don't like it so much. Um, also, some kind of differential SES-based funding formulas, which has strong socio-political probability, but perhaps less pedagogical probability. And then high pedagogical probability and low socio-political probability would be implementing the national curriculum 
as a precondition for public funding. This has low socio-political dimensions because mainly of the religious sector and the ultra-orthodox sector, which is against the national curriculum. So this has high probability pedagogically, but low probability socio-politically. And also, um, injuring any kind of comprehensive education, as I said, integration is weakening. And of course, a warning that says that complex problems require complex solutions. That's one of the problems in education policy that the public always thinks that a very complex problem has a very simple solution. Um, finally, a, a, a word of caution from these great words by Stephen Ball. I think that the best book that he's written is Education PLC, uh, PLC being Public Limited Company. Education PLC, um, understanding private section involvement in private sector education, in, in public sector education from 2007. Now, as you know, Stephen Ball is an important sociologist of education, quite critical of decentralization, neoliberal policies, globalization, etc. Now, in this book, for 185 pages, he talks against privatization, decentralization, and different forms of governance. But then, on page 187, he says this. And this is really great, especially coming from him, if you understand where he's situated in the uh, critical theory, sociology, sociology of education approach in the UK. So he says, there is no going back to a past in which public sector as a whole worked well and worked fairly in the interests of all learners. There was no such past. And what he means is that where did all our current gaps come from, if not from a centralized system? So it's not that I'm standing here and saying, OK, let's go back to the 1970s when most of the schools were owned and run by the government. I'm not saying that, and neither is he. It is difficult to deny that some education businesses do some things well and perhaps better than some of the public sector and do enhance the lives and opportunities of young and not so young people. This is not a defense of the private sector as a whole, but it may involve an acceptance of some kinds of private sector participation are more defensible than others, and that some public sector work is not as defensible as all that. So this calls for a debate on regulation and on trust as tools to control this new type of system where people, NGOs, communities, LEAs, um, endorse different types of schools and different types of regulation. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, we can take some questions. Please, questions, comments. Remember, in 15 minutes, you're going to say, but could you, could you please explain how that really works? Because I know it's a problem. Please. Oh, it is. Yes. But some of them just ignore it. <laughs> Here we go. I told you that's going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, Well, I'll see if we can go back a bit. No, it's not working right now. Okay, let's see here. I think the computer has had enough of us for today. Okay, one moment. I'll go back to that one. Wait. Just one second, it'll be all right. Apologies. Thank you. 
Okay, I think this, this is in, in the next one of the most important slides here. First of all, let me make it clear that uh, this group of schools, the recognized non-formal, has many types of schools. A lot of them fully comply with the national curriculum, but some don't. It also depends what part they belong to, and there's a big government debate about that. There were several interesting court cases in 2004, 2005, and some interesting legislation in 2008 called something the, the law of cultural schools um, or a cultural stream of schools that formally allows some of these schools to be exempt of the national curriculum. Um, how does it work? It doesn't really work. It's a, it's a debate. It's a political issue, very central to a lot of the political and social debates in Israel for the last 20 years. That's, that's the best I can say. Of course, the government is doing its best, or mainly the Ministry of Education, not always the government, because the coalition has different factions. And some of the ultra-Orthodox factions inside the coalition are, of course, against the national curriculum or parts of the national curriculum. But the Ministry of Education is doing, I think, a pretty formidable job in trying to keep the national curriculum um, compulsory for all schools. This does not always work. Okay, it's the best I can say so far. Yes, please. Others. Yes. Yes. Well, one thing I can say is that this is the issue of having primary legislation on public education is also part of educational, political, and social debate in Israel for the last decade. First of all, we had the Dovrat Committee in year 2005, which came with a, a bill of some kind of a public education law. Then there's a movement called All Education, Hakol Chinuch, uh, which is run... Uh, by a kind of a, a group of people who worked in the Dovrat Committee, and especially Rabbi Shai Piron. He's going to be in the conference uh, this week. You're going to hear him out. Uh, he has very strong views on this. So they have a bill of their own. They, we, I'm part of that as well. Um, they have uh, their legal committee, and we have a bill that is uh, currently being debated by uh, the Secretary of State, the Minister of Education, um, Gidon Saar. Uh, there are other attempts. The protest that has been going on last year has said some things about legislation. So far, nothing is really happening. Perhaps there is a small glimpse of hope now that there's this huge coalition government um, that has been around for a week. We don't know what, what that means yet. Um, Israel has a tendency of all kinds of weird things happening unexpectedly. So um, perhaps this government that is much stronger and has two big parties will do something about changing the voting system to something that will be more centralized. I don't know. This is not my field. You should ask someone who's into public policy or politics to explain that a bit more. Um, I don't know. Right now, there is nothing material except for things on the table, part of debate, which is important. It wasn't around before, but there's nothing going on yet. I cannot see that happening. The, the recent legislation from 2007, 2008, and 8 is mainly legislation that strengthens the fragmentation of the system and strengthens the groups that receive public money without um, being accountable to the public practically in any way. So I'm not optimistic on that point at this point of time. Yes, please. Anyone else? Last one. Oh, yeah, please. Sorry. Pardon? The train. Yes. Okay. Um, basically, they're, they're the same for these two columns. Not for all the schools in the second column, but for most of them. And not so for the third one, but that's a really small and rather extreme group. 
The interesting change in Israel's society, in Israel's school system, is this column here. Uh, and the teachers in both these groups are basically licensed teachers, licensed by the government. But as there are more schools that are semi-privatized, we might see more teachers come into the system that have not been trained formally. We can see that happening in the UK already. You have private organizations like Teach First, like Future Leaders, that do their own teacher and head teacher or principal preparation in the UK. That might happen here as well. I don't know. So far, this is an area that the government has been able to control quite well. Thank you very much. Have a good conference.